My name is Anant Vyas. I work at Argonne National Laboratory. I'm a transportation technology analyst. Uh, what I do is develop uh, mathematical models to see how a technology is going to impact uh, US transportation and energy consumption. I also do models for greenhouse gases. I do not work on too many things related to criteria pollutants, but uh, I have published some papers uh, relating to India. One paper, and uh, I had sent that to organizers here if you received it. So the next, uh, does it go from here? Okay, about India, most of you may know, or some of you might have visited also, it's in the northern hemisphere itself. It's 1.27 million square miles, it's the seventh largest country. You know, three large countries are in western hemisphere, Canada, US, and Brazil. In Asia, Russia, China, and Australia on the southern hemisphere. The India is the seventh in the square miles. It's uh, at eight degree north to 37 degree north. It's its mainland. It's like a kite-shaped country. We'll show in the map later. But it has some islands, particularly recently, if you are following the Malaysian airline uh, uh, disappearance, the Indian Navy searched near Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which are situated around a little south, 6.8 degree and they are in Bay of Bengal. And it has a long coastal coastlines. It has a lot of, it's the Arabian Sea on one side, Bay of Bengal on the other side, and Indian Ocean at the south. If you consider the mainland, it has 3,800 miles, 900 miles, the, all the islands, they have some in Arabian Sea, some in Bay of Bengal. Indian standard, at an art, five and a half hours. Most of them are at hour, but because India's art shape, they wanted to have only one time, so they put it at a middle, uh, a little east of the middle, and that way it uh, it is set at five and a half. The Tropic of Cancer passes right here. Right here, it goes just north of Havana between uh, Key West and Havana, and it's the middle of the country. Actually, that happens to be the where I was born, where the traffic of cancer. Uh, half of the country is north of it, and half of it south. And uh, if you look at it, it's the same as Saudi Arabia, Libya, Algeria, and comes and passes through Mexico. This. India is, it's a setup, the political setup is mixture of British and US. They have states and state governments, but then also they have central government. And I will go in the next slide about this, but right now I just want to point out it has 28 states and seven union territories. Those are the small ones. You can see here, these are the old Portuguese colonies. And then uh, these islands are also a union territory. Then there is this French, te French ruled uh, Pondicherry. It's the French call it Pondicherry. Local people call it Puducherry. But uh, it's uh, it's also a because people are so used to not being with the Indian government, the union government rules that. So there are seven territories, like Washington D.C., Delhi. New Delhi, which is the, actually, everyone calls New Delhi, but local people always call it Delhi because there is no new and old. And that's also one of the union territory. Population, 1.27 billion. So you can see it's a small 1.27 million square mile and 1.27 billion. Uh, population is a high, very densely populated country. Less than, almost 50% of the population is 
25 years or younger. And population density ranges from 44 square mile, 44 per square mile, that is in this, uh, this is hilly, this is the Himalayan part, to 2300, which is the Delhi itself city. And there are 15 major languages. Uh, that is the main contention, because uh, you go from, one person goes from one state to other state, the language is different. Unless you have common language, like English, or in northern India, almost everyone speaks Hindi, which is, the, I think, the third lar largest spoken, or fourth largest, I don't know. It is English number one, uh, Mandarin, Spanish, and Hindi. These are us that way. Uh, so Hindi is the very popular language in the northern part from here onwards. Even Maharashtra, which is Mumbai, such as, as a capital, uh, they also speak Hindi, but uh, states here, they are not very familiar with Hindi. Yes. Now, coming to uh, the one slide got missed. Uh, two went out. Oh, OK. Let me see. Page up. Yes. The, India is the largest, 1.27 billion people and almost 800 million voters. It's the largest uh, democracy. It's a secular parliamentary democracy. So it follows the British kind of system. It is a prime minister and a cabinet. There are two houses. Uh, the particular figurehead is a president like a queen in England. The president and president is like a member by parliament, which is the house of the people and house of the state, and then state assemblies. And he is the, he is the head of country. They generally serve two terms, sometimes more. The first president served more longer. All others have stayed 10 years or less. Party with the majority in Lok Sabha. Lok means people in uh, Sanskrit. So Lok Sabha means assembly of people. It, they elect prime minister. The, recently there was an election and about uh, 600, little over 600 million people voted. It took about eight weeks to conduct the elections because they have to stagger state to state and all that. And finally, there was a party which was given a, a majority and the prime minister was selected and he has taken office right now. They all selected by popular vote, similar to US uh, uh, senators or uh, representatives. Uh, there are 536 seats or 537 seats. So that means they have to have millions of votes to get elected. Uh, uh, the term limit, terms are five years. Everyone is for five year term. Rajya Sabha, the Assembly of State, which is uh, a similar to House of Lords in London. It's not like Senate here, because it's uh, just they, most of the time they stamp whatever the party, House of People does, but sometimes they content and they get it changed. But most of the time, they are actually elected by the state legislators. Each state sends so many delegates to the uh, Assembly of States. And uh, then they actually, this upper house. And each state has a, they call it Vidhan Sabha, means those who create laws, local law, laws. The, that is the state legislation. That also elected by popular votes every five years. But each state has its own assembly. They decide how many members they want to have and all. They have a chief minister. And uh, with his cabinet, he runs the state. There are two union territories, New De that is the Delhi and uh, Pondicherry. They also elected to have their own legislative assemblies. All other five smaller territories are ruled by central government. They appoint a person to run, 
And he says, I need so many people, so that is the, the civil service sends them people to run that state. And then they hire local people to do other jobs. You know. Actually, Constitution is modeled after US, England, and Australia. Some items are taken from New Zealand, one or two, but most of them are modeled after the and it has uh, personal rights, freedom of, freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is uh, almost taken to the extreme like it is taken here in US. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of contention, a lot of suits going on, but uh, central Supreme Court really sides with people. Sure, if, <coughs> India has started, when it became independent, didn't have a very good road network. But over 60 years, they have developed a very good road network. There were three kinds of major roads. One is the national highways, which is not interstate, because interstates actually are completely great separator. All national highways are not 100% great separator. Some are great separators, some are not great separator. But they are multiple lanes always. And uh, they actually uh, are travel. They, though they are about 10% or less of the total miles, uh, they carry about 40% of the travel traffic. There are state highways, similar to US as state highways. And uh, there is a lot of miles of them. There are three times of this. And then major highways and district highways, like the county roads we have here in the US, they have all those roads, but most of them are either are two lane or single lane. Single lane means when you have to pass someone, they, you have to have the two lanes, when state put somewhere place, extra two lanes. Uh, if anyone has gone to West Virginia, uh, you will see that there are places where they go on the mountains, and then there are trucks stop on the right side for let the other traffic go. Uh, and uh, same, similar to that they have. And then there are rural roads. Uh, half of them may be dirt roads, uh, kind of, uh, but uh, they are actually set up though that in the monsoon time she can be, you can travel still on that because they are elevated and as a stone, as a base or all this thing. The highways are used so much because it's uh, similar to US uh, because uh, trucks can provide door to door service while uh, rail and other actually take time. There are chances of dam damage and all these things. And uh, so it has become popular. And most popular is the bus travel. Any person going 100 miles or less, they always prefer bus travel because buses go closer to their destination. They don't have to go to train station and then have some kind of convenience to go home or anything. So. Most of the people traveling less than 100 miles, or even some places like I, I have traveled 300 miles on red conditioned buses and uh, from point to point. They don't stop anywhere else, and uh, they are very convenient. But those luxury buses, can, common person cannot afford it, only because uh, people who have more money can uh, actually afford this kind of buses. Actually, vehicle population, they, they don't have as many vehicles as US has. Uh, the, the year, the two wheelers dominate. They are almost 102 million. You know, US has about 270 million cars, only 8 million motorcycles, two wheelers. And uh, here, it's the other way around. Out of 140, for 2 million, 102 million are two wheelers. Uh, there are three wheelers uh, which actually carry passengers on a local travel. It's a, like a taxi. And then there are cars, these are private. And then they have taxis separately because uh, uh, taxis, actually, big cities have a lot of them. So they have a different kind of registration process. Jeeps are actually similar to our light trucks here and SUVs, but they don't have any. Many SUVs they have started having now, like General Motors is selling Chevrolet, 
cars, the Jeeps, uh, SUVs there, and uh, Honda also sending, selling, and uh, uh, some local Tata Motors also has some uh, uh, SUVs, but not too many. Buses, you can see there are a lot. You know, in US there are half of half that amount, and majority of them are uh, school buses. Like uh, here, there are no school buses actually. School children are actually transported by their parents, or they actually take three wheelers to go to school. Uh, but so, and then these are the actually trucks. They call it uh, goods vehicles. So total 141 million, but majority of them are two wheeler. India actually has a very extensive rail network. Uh, initially started by Britishers and uh, local uh, princely states, which were uh, actually cooperating Britishers, all actually opted for a uh, uh, rail network. They have uh, this uh, very wide gauge, much wider than what we have in US standard gauge. And uh, most of that is that some of them are one meter. And hilly areas, you might have seen these uh, movies of Darjeeling, uh, where there is a toy cars go all the way around and all that, that is where they are. So there are. These are all in mountain areas, uh, and there are only 15, 40 miles. But majority of this, this is where the everything moves. The, it carries over 7 billion, 7.6 billion passengers annually. And if you look at that, it's about, uh, you have to go over 100 miles to actually generally rail. Though somewhere it is convenient to go one place to other places very easily. It carries a lot of goods, but now it's 40% because uh, the truck started carrying more. Uh, when it, at the independence, it carried almost 80% of the goods, but now it's about 40 to 45%. And uh, this is 10 miles because it's a longer distance uh, and uh, it's cheaper to send by rail than by truck. Aviation, actually aviation, when India became independent, it had one international airline, Air India, and one local airline, Indian Airlines. But it is growing, and particularly last 20, 25 years, that actually they built airport everywhere, and uh, modern airports are even very, very much like uh, Western airport. And uh, there, are, there are 82 airports which provide regular, and they are expanding, they are building more. And then there are 72 foreign airlines operate through actually India's major cities. And there are 1360 international flights per week because everyone does not operate every day, but major airlines does like Continental has one flight every day out of Mumbai. And uh, some other airlines like British Airways and Lufthansa have through New Delhi and Mumbai both. Uh, by the way, Bombay was the British pronunciation, but local people always call it Mumbai. So they changed the spelling of Bombay to Mumbai. Uh, uh, there are three in international airlines. They operate this many flights. They that they did not necessarily come to Europe or anything. They go to uh, Afghanistan or uh, Saudi Arabia and. Uh, Nepal, Bhutan, uh, Thailand, and uh, uh, like uh, Myanmar, but it's Burma, original Burma. And uh, there are 14 Indian airlines, and they 200, uh, 235 million passengers. So aviation is a very growing sector of transportation in India. Now we come to energy use. Now. Total use is 24.4. Now that includes the electricity conversion losses. While compared to that, United States uses 27 and a half quads in transportation alone. And total co consumption in US in 2010, this is 2010 number, so 2010 was 98 quadrillion BTU. 
So compared to that, uh, India's energy use very little. It's 25% uh, of what U.S. consumes. Uh, industry is the major user. Transportation uses only 2.4 quadrillion, which is equivalent to 8.1 times 2.4. So it's about 19 billion gallon or something. Uh, it's not too much. And uh, electricity conversion losses, it's same thing in the US also. It's one third only delivered as electricity, two thirds lost. And the same thing here. Now, if you go by fuel type, liquids are 6.6. Uh, majority of them are for transportation, but industry and probably uh, electricity, there's electricity, some remote places, they use diesel generators, so they, they also use this. Natural gas 2.4, it's mainly industry and residential uh, for uh, cooking and uh, northern part heating too. And uh, coal, which is uh, for electricity, 12.6 watts. Nuclear, they have few nuclear uh, generators, but it's not uh, too many. Uh, our uh, Department of Energy projects that they may go five times that in 30 years or so, but not too much. Renewables, which is a uh, hydroelectric wind, those are the two, and the third is the wood. That's the northern, particularly Himalayas, there are a lot of trees and local people all use wood for uh, uh, cooking and you know, heating. In the transportation, actually, uh, I broke it down. So as I said, it's majority of uh, the petroleum plus other fuels uh, and natural gas. Actually, it is increasing natural gas uh, use because the major cities had a pollution problem, particularly the diesel buses and all, they're polluting a lot. So Supreme Court forced local transit agencies to convert all those uh, public work to natural gas. And uh, it is becoming popular. It's mainly up to the state to force uh, natural gas use. And uh, all major cities in the uh, state of Gujarat, where I come from, anyone over one million uh, they are forcing all the three wheelers to go to natural gas because they were initially two strokes. Uh, local uh, environment protection, uh, their uh, local state countries agency forced them to go to four, four strokes so that uh, actually the pollution went down and now they are actually forcing them to go to natural gas. And uh, electricity use in uh, this is mainly railroads. Uh, in transportation. Now, this shows you how congested the major cities are. Uh, this is how the lo local traffic looks almost all the time. I have seen it's very difficult to move. Uh, and uh, there are buses, three wheelers, two wheelers, and uh, cars. And uh, this all get congested. Uh, and uh, this is a big city like uh, Mumbai and uh, New Delhi. Uh, other cities also have. I have a here video someone had done. Uh, uh, not playing. Should be playing I, once I got it. Oh, OK, yeah. Now you will see how they actually move. There, there are, you have to be there, close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> And then there will be pedestrian crossing in between once. You will see, yeah, look at that guy. Which 
but everyone is very patient. They stop, let other people go, and then they, as soon as they find an opening, they rush through. This, the, that's it. Uh, though, uh, it, uh, I'm still working at Argonne, but I have uh, retired, and this is my last year. Uh, so beginning next year, I will be home most of the time. <laughs> Any questions I'm willing to ask, answer? That video is amusing, yeah. but how, what, what, are the, what are the accident rates? Like? Accident rate is very high. <laughs> uh, uh, this, this was actually less congested, that's why there were no accidents. Particularly the, between the cities where there are one lane roads and they, people become daredevil and try to pass someone and then someone is coming in the opposite direction. There are a lot of accidents, particularly two-wheelers. Two-wheelers, those drivers lose their balance. And uh, if they are wearing even a helmet, they have no chance of surviving against a truck or a, a SUV. SUVs are not too many, but trucks are actually going everywhere. And if they hit that, their accident rate is almost uh, five times the US rates. US rate, though there are less vehicles, so it is per, uh, one million uh, vehicle miles of travel, it's almost five times. Uh, so in the larger cities where there's lots of congestion, are they doing anything for public transportation other than buses? I mean, are they trying light rail or elevated or anything to get people out of that, that heavy traffic? I did get uh, the correct one. It's the public transportation you're talking about? Yeah, something yes, other than public bus. transportation is everywhere. All big cities have public transportation. Buses plus all cities over five million have either busways or uh, uh, metro local. And uh, cities like Mumbai and Calcutta and Madras, which is now called Chennai, uh, they had surface railroads running local for British time. So uh, when they, even India became independent, they had electrified railroads running on those three cities. They built new metro in uh, Delhi, and then they are building metros in other cities like Kanpur and uh, 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 Calcutta. They are expanding, actually. in. Uh, Bombay, so now called Mumbai, they actually brought, earlier it was going, it's a, Bombay is a kind of strip of island connected together going north-south. So original trains were all running north-south, but now they have built two metros which go east-west so that people can go from there. And they have built uh, uh, bridges over the creeks, the ocean, so the train can go across, and uh, the new development has started away from uh, the island. Is it helping? Yes. Is it helping? Yeah, you didn't get it. Is it helping? Is, the, uh, is it helping the congestion? Is it helping? The oh, <laughs> considering the population growth, I don't know whether this uh, can help. Uh, uh, Biggest problem has been actually people from villages go for jobs to big city. They don't have too much, I mean, they don't have very high income. They are going to go for some kind of job because they don't have anything to do in village and big city like Bombay. And uh, so they try to go to public transportation only. That's the only thing they can afford. So the, the new metros, are very much like here where the doors closed whenever the moves, train moves, but they are very expensive. While the original thing, doors don't close, people hang outside, and uh, there are a lot of accidents there too, but uh, not too many. I mean, the Calcutta, people actually have climbed up on the roof of the cars also sometimes, 
but uh, it's not advisable because these are electric with pentagraph and all these things. Yes. So they actually, the police will stop the train from if they see anyone on the roof. Uh, but uh, there are actually big city, Calcutta and Mumbai, have a lot of congestion problems. Other cities like uh, New Delhi and uh, Chennai, they are spread and they have a uh, space. Uh, Calcutta, as you know, it's uh, now on the Ga river Ganges and this side there is nothing and there are uh, some ocean, I mean, there are Hooghly River and all that. So it is also landlocked with mean, three, three sides of water and all that. So that's why, same thing with Bombay. It has water on both sides and uh, you can go north, south only and uh, distances are farther for people have to travel more for jobs. Uh, I actually have a couple of questions. Um, lately, uh, I've at least read quite a bit about how in China, uh, with increasing energy usage, including that related to transportation, yes. uh, there has been deep popular discontent with environmental conditions, mm -hmm. smog being one clear uh, emblem that's pointed to. Uh, and so the Communist Party in China uh, has, at least uh, from what I've read, has been implementing new environmental policies to try to improve quality of life in response to this political pressure. Now, similarly, recently, just a few months ago in Brazil, there were a lot of popular protests that were triggered by an increase in uh, bus fare mm -hmm. uh, in Sao Paulo, if it then spiraled into other cities and became uh, other political interests were involved. And so in each of these cases, we see two rapidly developing economies, Brazil and China, in which there's been popular political pressure to address issues related to energy and transportation, whether it be due to in the environment or due to the cost of getting around. And I was curious whether there was similar popular political pressure in India to respond to these issues, the environment as well as the affordability of transportation. Uh, and then more generally, uh, what kind of policies exist to try to manage the responsible or sustainable growth of transportation and energy usage in India, if any? Yeah. Uh, right now, there is a strike going on, particularly, there was a rail fare increase, and uh, people didn't like it, because that's their major way to go between cities, and uh, they have actually lied down on the tracks to stop trains and all that thing. And uh, so there has been a railroad service. Right now, it, there is a, some kind of disruption in some states. And in the past, whenever rail fare increase, has, this kind of thing has gone on. And uh, accepting a major line, it has affected the maintenance of the tracks and uh, the structure and the bridges and all that. So the train speeds, which were very good, at the time of independence, where we could actually go from one place to other place very well, has actually slowed down. And uh, that means it takes longer now to go from one place to other by train than other, though main lines are still maintained very well uh, because that's uh, their bread and butter, that's the freight moves and that's where they get the money. The people moving, they are subsidizing. They are not actually getting anything out of people moving, but they have to do that service because people don't have any other way to move. Uh, so they are doing it, but they still have to increase fear to just break uh, with subsidy from government. And uh, they have, they, there are certain parties which are actually saying that they should at least have 50% from fear and 50% be subsidized but that's not working out uh, right so far, and that has been almost 60 to 70% uh, subsidy uh, fare is not paying. And the uh, biggest problem is the Indian government was running deficit uh, financing, and uh, they cannot go on that way, so there has been a continuous contention. As far as the road transport pollution is going, uh, the buses are owned by government most of the time, or local cities, uh, because they're, they have a transit agency, uh, and they are run by the local cities. And uh, they are similar to here. We, here we have FTA, Federal Transit Administration, which actually pays for the rolling stock, and then uh, 
uh, local operators actually try to collect the rest of the operating cost from the fare. Similarly, there also they are trying to do it. Whenever bus fare goes up, then again there are problems and people actually storm either the city mayor or the transit agency's headquarters and all those. And uh, it, that has been a big contention because the average person have no idea how the transit agency budget is run. They think that they have a right to travel and at a, as, as cheap as possible. And, uh, and particularly when you consider that uh, national average per capita income is around $3,000 per year, uh, which is very low compared to 60000 for U.S. Uh, so they, they, this is a, now when you get average 3,000, so you know that actually 50% has more than 50% than have below. And out of 1.27 billion, 600 million or less than that, they, they are the one who are using public transportation. When we have the higher, they can take cabs or they can actually have their own cars and all that thing. So there has been a big uh, uh, local government and uh, particularly politicians are very wary of because that's their base, uh, particularly these people. And uh, they want to actually get their votes. So they actually, it continuously goes back and forth. Uh, and uh, uh, so far, people have won because uh, it's, uh, politicians want to throw something to them and get their votes. That's uh, though in this last election, uh, what happened is actually the person who was actually, the, there was a party, Congress party, which was in power for 10 years, and they actually created a lot of uh, giveaways for the people, this and that and that. And this new party which came into power, his head, he said, this is not the way to live. This, we can't go on like this. And he kept on saying that that uh, we should stop all this uh, give out giveaways, let people work hard, you have to earn your living, we can help you, we can try to get you a job, but this, and he won, he got this uh, majority. And uh, so there has been some change, but uh, most of the analysis I've read is it's only the middle class which was fed up because they were su supporting the lower caste and they, they are the one who vote. The poor people don't vote as many. So that's why this person goes on. Now, if we can't deliver that in five years, next five years you'll be out. So that's As you describe these various sectors, we yeah. can see that the energy use in India would still be comparatively low compared yeah. to some other countries. And I was just wondering how fast do you think that is going to change? At what point would this very large population be using quite a bit more energy? Yeah, actually, uh, the energy, there is only the northern states require heating energy for a household. So it's only residential energy is all cooking, uh, not any other that. So transportation is where the movement, mobility increases. So as people become prosperous, transportation from 2.4, projection is that it will go almost four times that by 20, uh, 2040. Uh, and uh, electricity use is increasing. Electricity use increasing mainly because the r villages are being electrified and uh, the rural electrification is really increased. Uh, different states have different rates because it's only state government which does most of the electrification, rural electrification. So states which are very well to do, they have almost 80% to 90% electrification rate. Those are where not well to do, it's around 50 to 60%. So that is going to go eventually, it will become 100%. And so electricity is where the coal and natural gas are used. And, uh, uh, wind is actually, hydro and wind are the renewable, which is the electricity uh, being used. So that is going to increase. It's likely to be almost three times what it is right now. Then if the industry 
expand, start producing more and more, they also require more energy. So our uh, Department of Energy does international energy uh, outlook. And uh, they have projected from 24.4, they will go almost uh, 60 by 2040. So you have plans to increase the transportation because it seems like there is a huge gap between the 1.27 billion people and roughly 141 million vehicles. Right. So is that a growth area? Well, two wheelers are growing very fast. Okay. And that is the local people can afford it. The bicycle also is uh, heavily used, but it doesn't figure in uh, environment, uh, energy and environment aspect. But uh, in uh, bicycles are also used. Two wheelers, which are uh, mainly mopeds, and uh, all big cities you go, or even in small village you go, all mid middle class families have one or two, mo all of them have it, and each household. In you know, following up with that, why is the government enforcing natural gas usage for the two-wheelers? Is that because of the low carbon uh, dioxide emissions, um, which is under controversy for natural gas? Natural gas is mainly for uh, forcing pollution, big cities pollution only. So because diesel engines actually have this particulate uh, emissions, and because of the dense population, there are all high rises everywhere, big cities. So the, there is nowhere for uh, that uh, pollution, the polluted air to move too much. And that's why the, the courts are forcing big city to go, if they are using public transportation, plus also private uh, cars, they are giving some incentive for conversion. You know, conversion costs money, and they are saying, okay, we'll give you 1,000, or something, so you convert and then do. The one thing is the trip length in India is not very long. People hardly go 10 miles for any other thing. It's a similar, it's not too long, uh, very far. While here we go 40 miles very easily anywhere to go. And uh, most of the people here, uh, average per car, it's almost 11,900 miles or 12,000 miles a year. While in uh, India, for uh, even if you own a car, it's about 3,200 kilometers per year. So 2,000 miles a year, that's a very low. Buses are the one, the paper I had sent, uh, we have in there, the miles people drive. Buses are driven more, trucks are driven more. But still, they, uh, trucks here, uh, the particularly the semis big and which are new, they go one million miles a year here in US, uh, going from city to transporting regularly. While in uh, India, they may be going 25,000 miles a year. Uh, so one million, 25 is a big uh, difference. Uh, uh, so there, there, there is uh, uh, goods even when they move, they do not move from uh, one end of the country to other end of the country. If they are going from one end to other, rail. Why hasn't India adopted a more organized approach to uh, traffic such as other countries have? For example, it would seem there would be less energy consumption, less pollution if they simply designated lanes, for example, one lane for bicycles and rickshaws, another for buses and uh, truck traffic, uh, et cetera. Uh, I, it's it, it's easier said than implemented. <laughs> That's uh, you saw in the traffic. People just uh, uh, if you have anyone visited India, yes, yes you have seen that, right? <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's police have to be everywhere. Even when they are there, I, I've seen that they stand at certain places. Only thing they actually do is no one breaks the uh, gets into an accident. Otherwise, they just like, if, I, if I'm wanted to cross the road, they will stop me until uh, the, there is gap and say, then go. But otherwise, they do not interfere people changing lanes or uh, turning. Uh, as long as they don't break the traffic laws, they let them go. Uh, 
Uh, you, you mentioned a couple of times about subsidies, government subsidies. Uh, what's the uh, source of funds for governments in India? Is it, is it um, income tax, property tax, value added taxes? Right. That All would have of, some uh, property taxes are generally for the local governments, but there are value added tax. VAT, have you heard of VAT? VAT is the major source. Plus, there are other taxes, user taxes, and uh, uh, like uh, <coughs> government actually it d does uh, taxing on uh, each corporations and all that thing. And uh, that's where the industry and they pay majority of tax. Individual income tax also is fairly high rate, but it's only for uh, people who are beyond certain limits. So middle class, and upper class pays income tax. Poor people don't pay most of them. So, so it seemed like then so people would be laying down on the tracks in some ways because they feel that they've already paid for some of their travel right. and so they pay taxes. And so in some ways there's a connection between, yeah, but it's not free see, in other words. Poor people don't pay, the middle class pays taxes and uh, poor people are the ones which are actually demonstrating because they cannot afford the increase of care. <laughs> and uh, that that's goes on particularly uh, in India also similar to here. We have certain threshold beyond that. You, uh, and below that, you don't pay tax. There also, there's a lot of cash economy. That means if you actually are doing, someone comes to your home and does work, you pay cash and then that's the no track of that. So that's what goes on. Are you aware of an increase in retirees um, from North America returning home to India? North American? Um, the retirees returning home to North America, from, from, from North America. Are you seeing an increase in people going back home? I didn't get the clear. What? Yeah. So it's about uh, transportation or it's home? For in individuals from India who migrated to the United States uh, returning back to India upon retirement? Some are doing, but not all of them. But most of them who are doing actually are very successful. And they have actually started some kind of industry there or some business there, uh, but uh, not too many. Most of them are stayed here. And uh, they've been successful here also, like you know, the Coast Life, you know, started Sun Microsystems, and uh, there are so many others I can uh, just uh, the, to list. Like uh, Microsoft CEO is of Indian origin. Uh, there are so many others, uh, uh, but they mainly biggest problem is that I, I wanted to go back, my kids don't didn't want to go back, and then what's the, what do we want to do? Uh, we have a lot of friends who are all retired and say we want to go back and kids says no way we are not going to go. We have grown up here and we only country we know is this. So that's why no one is. Just, very rarely, some have gone back. I won't say that they have not gone back. I have two friends who have <coughs> gone back and successfully started and started business there. I have uh, an, another question, and it's yes. this. Given the projected increase in both the uh, amount of energy used in transportation, but also in other sectors in India, would you have specific recommendations to make for the responsible or, or sustainable development uh, of energy to satisfy well, these growing they're, needs? They're really trying. There are uh, two, three organizations there. They are actually working on uh, pollution, uh, reducing the energy use, and also reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, they actually, local people, local uh, education level particularly is very high. If you know, certain state has 98% uh, illiteracy rate, and um, uh, most of the middle class uh, kids all go through college, and uh, there are a lot of PhDs and a lot of that, so they, really know what to do. Uh, the resources are the mainly problem, and uh, politicians sometimes get in the way. These are actually technocrats. I mean, they are actually know how to do technology, but uh, 
politicians say because their base is, doesn't want this to be done or doesn't want that to be done. If you remember here, there is a CTA is going to change their line and they want to raise certain houses. There has been a lot of resistance for that. In the same in India, actually, they actually, they, anything else, they actually have a big procession and easily 2,000, 3,000, you can easily get to come out in procession. And uh, if it is a very serious issue, you can get 10,000 or 100,000. Uh, I wanted to also just offer uh, a couple of comments, especially to uh, uh, having in mind our uh, audience of educators, yeah. where looking at the video that you yeah. offered us, which really was so attention grabbing and remarkable, right. I couldn't help but think of how it could be used in classrooms to teach a number of different lessons. I think even the most dyed in the wool Montana libertarian um, would see this video and recognize the value in having some regulations to right. uh, govern the use of public space. Right. Uh, and when you added the information that accidents rates are five times greater than the United right. States, there is clear evidence to recommend right. uh, the, the existence of some regulations to govern the use of public they, space in this particular way. They actually way. have regulation on paper. The implementation <laughs> is not that great. <laughs> And uh, uh, the video, whoever done, has sped up a little bit, actually. The, the, you can see the, the people don't move that walking, people don't run that. So someone has actually deliberately sped up that video. But average traffic doesn't move that fast. Those who have gone to India might have noticed that they stop and they don't rush up that fast. They just start slowly. But there are people are very, very, uh, means careful, they want to avoid, but majority of the accidents happen at intersections or when someone tries to pass someone. That is a major thing. But in, even with that, that yeah. caveat given, uh, yeah. it, it seemed to me that uh, as one could easily, or one could imagine leading students through a calculation of the costs of, say, travel, right. uh, and the ways in which regulations work to reduce or at least distribute those costs. So if one cost of travel is the propensity of an accident, we mm -hmm. can see how that cost can be lowered. That is, the pretense, pretend, propensity for an accident can be lowered through some sorts of regulations. But even just thinking of other sorts of regulations related to pollution and the environment. So these days, I know I need to take my car in for admissions testing here in the state of Illinois, because it was recognized that emissions from automobiles due to the combustion of gasoline has a cost that we all have to pay right. in terms of the air we breathe, its effects on our health, more general environmental repercussions. And it seems to me, well, students in a classroom may be less keen on thinking about automobile emissions. Um, mm -hmm. You show a video like this, and you have an opportunity to get them interested in things like automobile emissions, because seeing the uh, risk of accident so uh, marvelously demonstrated here, I think be can become a stepping stone to broader lessons about how to govern uh, the costs of something like transportation, whether it be the physical risk to our bodies in terms of moving, or uh, a less immediate risk of health consequences of emissions and things like that. And so I thought it was really artfully demonstrated yeah. in, in the video. But, uh, you know, it's much easier to, uh, those vehicles control, they already have Euro 2 standards. If you, uh, the paper we, published uh, Aurora, Salil was the major writer. He did a lot of work on that. He actually went to India because he could not get much information here and met with the, the auto agencies and all collected a lot of information. And uh, he was the major contributor in that. Uh, he left Argonne and is now working with Archer Daniels because he can make more money there. <laughs> So, but it, it, that's where we are actually saying what kind of standards are. It's very easy to control the manufacturers because they enforce a debt before you certify, you can sell this vehicle, it has to meet their center. But the biggest problem has been actually that accepting the bigger metro areas, anything about say 1 million or all, the other areas, the maintenance actually brings the pollution up. 
And uh, there the government has no way to tell uh, that uh, any population center over one million has the m mandatory testing requirement. And then just uh, finally, uh, a final yeah. comment by, by way of a thank you. Um, the material you, you present and the uh, broader context you've offered in the Q&A as well, I think really points to a, a huge problem that the world faces in the next few decades, right. where energy usage, whether from transportation or other sectors, is increasing in India, right. the world's largest democracy, will continue to increase. We see it in China, we see it elsewhere right. in Asia, Southeast Asia, right. in Brazil and Latin America. And so when we see images of traffic jams, traffic and think jam. about the consequences, they're not merely theoretical medical questions, no. uh, but ones that uh, have huge impacts for people who live in those countries and in those cities, but for all of us. Right. So. Actually, I, yeah, we're, actually we're, there is a joke going on among all the non-resident Indians here. They say all the atheists should be sent to India, and they will know God exists. Otherwise, they cannot go on like this. <laughs> <laughs> So please join me in yes. thanking uh, Mr. Vyas. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.